Today, we're taking a look at the Blackburn Blackbird, an aircraft that was designed to be built in large numbers, but never was, and one that was designed to be easy to handle, which it also never was. In late 1917, it was realised that the Sopwith Cuckoo, while an excellent plane, lacked the punching power required for a torpedo bomber. Admiralty tests had revealed that its 1,085-pound Mark IX torpedo was not capable of sinking large warships, and so, in the autumn of 1917, the Admiralty issued specification N-1B. This called for a single-seat aircraft capable of carrying the larger 1,423-pound Mark VIII torpedo. In the near future, this specification would be redesignated as the Type 22 when the Royal Naval Air Service was absorbed into the RAF. In February of 1918, contracts were placed for the construction of six prototypes. Three would be built by Short Brothers Limited, and three by Blackburn, of whom Robert Blackburn went with the inventive strategy of naming the new torpedo bomber by simply changing the last letter of his surname. Uninspiring naming strategies aside, Robert Blackburn was determined to have his new aircraft win the competitive trials against the Shorts. He was so determined, in fact, that the company supplied their prototypes to the Admiralty at a cost of just £2,200 each, or approximately two-thirds of their actual cost. The Blackbird was designed by Harris Booth, and intended for shipboard service aboard Britain's first aircraft carrier, the Argus. It was a large, three-bay, unstaggered biplane with folding wings, and it was designed on the simplest possible lines for cheap and rapid production. For this reason, the wings maintained a constant cord and uniform cross-section throughout their length, so that, if need required it, they could be ordered and produced en masse. The same principle was applied to the fuselage, which was built up from four rectangular spruce box longerons. It maintained a constant depth from nose to tail, and this, combined with the uniform wing shape, made the Blackbird look like a glorified matchbox with two rulers taped onto its top and bottom. Although it was designed to be built quickly, it is doubtful that this could have been achieved with the fuselage. It looked simple enough, however the man-hours required to produce the struts and box longerons was considerable particularly as the latter tapered towards the rear, and it would have likely been the main production bottleneck had the plane been ordered in large numbers. Per the Admiralty specification, the Blackbird was to be powered by a 350 horsepower Rolls-Royce Eagle 8, which drove a two-blade propeller. Fuel was pumped from a 74-gallon tank in the second bay of the fuselage, and a 9-gallon oil tank was fitted approximately two feet behind the engine. The weight of this engine, combined with that of the Mark VIII torpedo, presented a bit of a problem in terms of the centre of gravity, and so during the design phase it was decided to install the pilot's cockpit considerably further back, to the tune of being 9 feet behind the centre section. In fact, it was approximately halfway between the trailing edge of the main wings and the tail, with 14 feet of fuselage in front of it, this cockpit offered woefully bad visibility for the pilot, and on top of this, it was also incredibly basic, having a wicker chair for the pilot which would have felt more at home in the summer of 1914 compared to the summer of 1918. Not counting the unfortunate position of the cockpit, the strangest thing about the Blackbird was its huge undercarriage. It was built in the form of a pin-jointed parallelogram with diagonal main legs, incorporating solid rubber shock absorbers. Upon closer inspection of some photos, it would seem that this undercarriage would block the release of any torpedo that the Blackbird carried, seeing as its axle sat below the torpedo itself. However, the wheeled portion of the undercarriage was designed to be jettisoned before the dropping of said torpedo, and the Blackbird was to be landed on the carrier using a pair of skids that were mounted in board of the wheels and just above the axle that was to be dropped. The ability for the wheels to be jettisoned also had the added advantage of making emergency water landing safer, as the wheels would not be there to act as a giant anchor which could flip over the plane, a situation that's not normally good for the pilot's health. The first Blackbird was completed in late spring of 1918, and at the end of May it was flown for the first time. 
Then, on the 4th of June, it was delivered to Martlesham Heath for performance and handling trials. Here, it did not endear itself to the test pilots or Martlesham's assessors, and when you take a look at their reports, it's easy to see why. Takeoff and landing was an interesting affair. The Blackbird featured innovative long span ailerons, which could all be lowered to act as flaps to shorten the takeoff run, something that would be very suitable for carry operations. However, not being double acting when lowered, they thus deprived the pilot of all lateral control, not so useful for carrier operations. After takeoff, it quickly became apparent that the Blackbird was only stable laterally, and the reports go on to say that it was incredibly nose heavy in almost every regard, be that climbing, diving, or in level flight, a trait that persisted even after the heavy torpedo had been released. Flying the Blackbird was exhausting. In fact, it was so exhausting that the pilots had to use a rubber bungee to hold the control stick in place so they could relieve their arms of the strain of holding the plane level on longer flights. Not only was the Blackbird dangerous on takeoff and nose heavy, but it was also difficult during landing and taxiing. It quickly became apparent that the rudder was ineffective, especially at slower speeds during landing, and this made it difficult to keep the aircraft facing into the wind during slow landings, and it made it impossible to taxi in winds that were greater than 8 miles an hour. Considering that the bulk of British naval operations during the war thus far were to be found in the North Sea, which was more temperamental than a disgruntled sea goddess, it's easy to understand why Martlesham had so many, many reservations about the Blackbird's effectiveness. This was only worsened when the first prototype crashed before its trials could be completed. Two more Blackbird prototypes were completed, per the initial contract. The second went to Scotland for torpedo trials before returning to Martlesham for more performance tests. By this point, it had an enlarged rudder to improve its landing performance. However, its effectiveness was never confirmed as the aircraft was permanently grounded due to concerns over weaknesses found in the fuselage structure. The third prototype was completed at about the same time as the Armistice, in November 1918. After spending some time at the development squadron at Gosport, it was sent to HMS Argus to be operated experimentally. By this point, however, the Admiralty had favoured the competition, the Short Shell, and in a case of extreme irony, they had asked Blackburn to build 100 of these aircraft. However, this order was soon changed again to 100 Sopwith Cuckoos, as the Emeralty's requirements in a post-war world had rapidly changed. In the end, neither of the competing planes were successful. And so ends the Blackbird's story. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a special thank you, of course, to the patrons, with a special shout out to Deliado, Kevin, Bane, and FB for their support as Wing Commander patrons. Thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.